Hello, hello, welcome back. And today we're going to be diving into this tremendous book, doing a little book review, you know, of the main points so you don't have to read it. And I know the title seems really terrible, like very not fun, <laughs> a long obedience in the same direction. And let me tell you that this is just an amazing book, it has amazing stories, like you guys will be hooked. I know I was. And it has really good points for, you know, how we are nowadays. We're in a fast food society, right? Whenever we want something, in two seconds, we go and get it. If we don't like the video we're watching, we just like flip, you know, flip our finger and we can watch another one. And we see this because on TV commercials, they could have them for like 30 seconds or a minute. They used to be able to do that. And nowadays, you have a three second attention span to get someone's attention or not. And sometimes we apply this to God even, we, or our spirituality, or, you know, our inner growth. We want these quick fixes. We want these shortcuts. We want to just pray to God and get the answer or, you know, get everything done in like three seconds or a minute at most, right? But this book is all about teaching us what life is truly about, which is, you know, the length and breadth of life. Like, why are we so much in a rush? to get everything right now. I have other videos you guys can watch on this topic of like the fear of missing out and another one, which I can't remember the name, but those are super good in talking about this of, you know, of why are we rushing? Like, what are we rushing towards? Our death? Like, there's no point in rushing. So this man, he starts off the book saying, you know, the title is A Long Obedience in the Same Direction, and the subtitle being Discipleship in an Instant Society by Eugene H. Peterson. And so he says that um, the biggest thing that Christians have gotten from the world, and I'm going to be saying this from like a Christian perspective, but you guys can apply this to any, you know, religion you guys follow. Um, he's saying that the one thing that Christians get from the world which, you know, we're supposed to separate ourselves from the world, but what we all have to some degree or another is the assumption that anything worthwhile can be acquired at once. So we always are just trying to get, you know, the fast cut, the shortcut, the quick way. He says the Christian life cannot mature under such conditions and in such ways. Frederick Nietzsche, I don't know how to say his name, N-I-E-T-Z-S-C-H-E, who is the person he got the quote from for the title of the book. Um, he was saying that Frederick Nietzsche, who saw this area of spiritual truth, at least with great clarity, wrote, The essential thing in heaven and earth is that there should be long obedience in the same direction, and thereby results, and has always resulted in the long run, something which has made life worth living. It is this long obedience in the same direction which the mood of the world does so much to discourage. So what he does in this book is he goes into the Song of As Ascent, Psalms 120 to 134, and dives deep into each of these and shows us how the Psalms teach us to grow in worship, service, joy, work, humility, community, and blessing. So these are the chapters. In discussing worship, the chapter on worship, he says, the words shalom and shalva in the Jewish tongue play on the sounds in Jerusalem, which is said, Jerusalem, the place of worship. Shalom, meaning peace, is one of the richest words in the Bible. You can no more define it by looking up its meaning in the dictionary than you can define a person by his or her social security number. It gathers all aspects of wholeness that result from God's will being completed in us. It is the work of God that, when complete, releases streams of living water in us and pulsates with eternal life. Each time Jesus healed, forgave, or called someone, we have a demonstration of shalom. And shalva, meaning prosperity. It has nothing to do with insurance policies or large bank accounts or stockpiles of weapons. The root meaning is leisure, the relaxed stance of one who knows that everything is all right because God is over us, with us and for us in Jesus Christ. It is the security of being at home in a history that has a cross at its center. It is the leisure of the person who knows that every moment of our existence is at the disposal of God 
lived under the mercy of God. Worship initiates an extended daily participation in peace and prosperity so that we share in our daily rounds what God initiates and continues. You know, we live in a pragmatic age and are reluctant to do anything if its practical usefulness cannot be demonstrated. It is inevitable that we ask regarding worship. Is it worth it? Can you justify the time and energy and expense involved in gathering Christians together in worship? Well, look at the mower in the summer's day with so much to cut down before the sun sets. He pauses in his labor. Is he a sluggard? He looks for his stone and begins to draw it up and down his scythe with a rink a tink, rink a tink, rink a tink. Is that idle music? Is he wasting precious moments? How much he might have mowed when he has been ringing out those notes on his scythe but he is sharpening his tool and he will do far more when once again he gives his strength to those long sweeps which lay the grass prostrate in rows before him. Next in his chapter on servitude of service, he says, the experience of servitude is still among us and is as oppressive as ever. Freedom is on everyone's lips. Freedom is announced and celebrated, but not many feel or act free. Evidence? We live in a nation of complainers and a society of addicts. Everywhere we turn, we hear complaints. I can't spend my money the way I want. I can't spend my time the way I want. I can't be myself. I'm under the control of others all the time. And everywhere we meet the addicts, addiction to alcohol and drugs, to compulsive work habits, and to obsessive consumption. We have traded masters. We stay enslaved. The Christian is a person who recognizes that our real real problem is not in achieving freedom, but in learning service under a better master. The Christian realizes that every relationship that excludes God becomes oppressive. Recognizing and realizing that, we urgently want to live under the mastery of God. For such reasons, all Christian service involves urgency. Servitude is not a casual standing around waiting for orders. It is never desultory. It is an urgent need. Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. And it's a reasonable service. The best New Testament commentary on this psalm is in the final section of Paul's letter to the Romans, chapters 12 through 16. The section begins with this sentence. So here's what I want you to do. God helping you, take your everyday, ordinary life. You're sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life and place it before God as an offering. This psalm has nothing in it about serving others. It concentrates on being a servant to God. Its position is that if the attitude of servanthood is learned by attending to God as Lord, then serving others will develop as a very natural way of life. Commands will be heard to be hospitable, to be compassionate, to visit the sick, to help and heal. Commands that Paul assembles in Romans 12 through 16 and many other places, and carried out with ease and poise. As we live out the implications of a life of service, we are provided with continuous encouragement and example by Jesus Christ who said, Do you understand what I have done to you? You address me as teacher and master, and rightly so. That is what I am. So if I, the teacher and master, washed your feet, You must now wash each other's feet. I've laid down a pattern for you. What I've done, you do. I'm only pointing out the obvious. A servant is not ranked above his master. An employee doesn't give orders to the employer. If you understand what I'm telling you, act like it and live a blessed life. John 13, 12 through 17. On complaining, he writes... My work as such is no more difficult than anyone else's. Any work done faithfully and well is difficult. It is no harder for me to do my job well than for any other person, and no less. There are no easy tasks in the Christian way. There are only tasks that can be done faithfully or erratically, with joy or with resentment. And there is no room for any of us, pastors or grocers, accountants or engineers, word processors or gardeners, physicians or teamsters, to speak in tones of self-pity of the terrible burdens of our work. Wow. 
And the person of faith is not a person who has been born luckily with a good disposition or a good digestion and a sunny disposition. The assumption by outsiders that Christians are naive or protected is the opposite of the truth. Christians know more about the deep struggles of life than others, more about the ugliness of sin. A look to the heavens can bring a breathtaking sense of wonder and majesty, and if a person is a believer, a feeling of praise to the God who made heaven and earth. This psalm looks the other direction and looks into the troubles of history, the anxiety of personal conflict and emotional trauma, and it sees there the God who is on our side, God our help. The close look, the microscopic insight into the dragon's terrors, the flood's water, and the imprisoning trap sees the action of God in deliverance. And this is Psalm 124. We speak our words of praise in a world that is hellish, We sing our songs of victory in a world where things get messy. We live our joy among people who neither understand nor encourage us. But the content of our lives is God, not humanity. We are not scavenging in the dark alleys of the world, poking in its garbage cans for a bare substance. We are traveling in the light towards God, who is rich in mercy and strong to save. It is Christ, not culture, that defines our lives. It is the help we experience not the hazards we risk that shapes our days. On the next psalm, on security, the chapter from Psalm 125, that God encircles his people. He was telling the story of two girls older than I, whom I very much admired, attractive and vivacious, went away to college. They returned for vacation wearing brighter lipstick and shorter skirts. From the pew in front of me on a Sunday morning, I heard the stage whispers, between two grandmotherly types. Do you think they have backslidden? One became a pastor's wife, the other a missionary with her husband in Africa. No backsliding was everywhere and always an ominous possibility. But both in the scriptures and watching the elders, you know, you find a background of confidence, a leisured security among persons of faith. You know, people of faith have the same needs for protection and security as anyone else. We are no better than others in that regard. What is different is that we find that we don't have to build our own. God is a safe place to hide, ready to help when we need him. Psalms 46 verse 1. All the same, we do become anxious. We do slip into fearful moods. We become uncertain and insecure. The confident, robust faith that we desire and think is our destiny is qualified by recurrent insecurities. You know, singing Psalms 125 is one way Christians have to develop confidence and banish insecurity. One threat to our security comes from feelings of depression and doubt. The person of faith is described in this psalm as a rock-solid mountain. Nothing can move it. But I am moved. I am full of faith one day and empty with doubt the next. I wake up one morning full of vitality, rejoicing in the sun. The next day, I am gray and dismal, faltering and moody. Nothing can move it. Nothing could be less true of me. I can be moved by nearly anything. Sadness, joy, success, failure. I am a thermometer and go up and down with the weather. A couple of years ago, a friend introduced me, the author, to the phrase, the sawtooth history of Israel. Israel was... Up one day and down the next. One day they were marching in triumph through the Red Sea, singing songs of victory. The next they were grumbling in the desert because they missed having Egyptian steak and potatoes for supper. One day they were marching around Jericho, blowing trumpets and raising hearty hymns. And the next they were plunged into an orgy at some Canaanite fertility shrine. One day they are with Jesus in the upper room, listening in rapt attention to his commands and receiving his love. The next, they are stomping around and cursing in the courtyard, denying that they ever knew him. But all the time, as we read that sawtoothed history, we realize something solid and steady. They are always God's people. God is steadfastly with them in mercy and judgment, insistently gracious. We get the feeling that everything is done in the sure, certain environment of the God who redeems his people. And as we learn that, we learn not We learn to live not by our feelings about God, but by the facts of God. I'm going to say that again. 
And as we learn that, we learn to live not by our feelings about God, but by the facts about God. I refuse to believe my depressions. I choose to believe in God. If I break my leg, I do not become less a person. My wife and children do not repudiate, repudiate me. Neither when my faith fractures or my feelings bruise, does God cast me off and reject me. My feelings are important for many things. They are essential and valuable. They keep me aware of how of much that is true and real. But they tell me next to nothing about God or my relationship to God. My security comes from who God is, not from how I feel. Discipleship is a decision to live by what I know about God, not by what I feel about Him or myself or my neighbors. As the mountains are round about Jerusalem, so the Lord is round about His people. The image that announces the dependable, unchanging, safe, secure existence of God's people comes from geology, not psychology. In speaking about defection, he says, Certainly, you may quit if you wish. You may say no to God. It's a free faith. You may choose the crooked way. He will not keep you against your will. But it is not the kind of thing you fall into by chance or slip into by ignorance. Defection requires a deliberate, sustained, and determined act of rejection. All the persons of faith I know are sinners, doubters, uneven performers. We are secure not because we are sure of ourselves, but because we trust that God is sure of us. The opening phrase of the psalm is, Those who trust in God. Not those who trust in their performance, in their morals, in their righteousness, in their health, in their pastor, in their doctor, in their president, in their economy, in their nation, but those who trust in God. Those who decide that God is for us and will make us whole eternally. Chapter 8 on Joy We laughed, we sang. Psalm 126 it seemed like a dream too good to be true when God returned Zion's exiles. We laughed, we sang, we couldn't believe our good fortune. We were the talk of the nations. God was wonderful to them. God was wonderful to us. We are one happy people. And now, God, do it again. Bring rain to our drought-stricken lives. So those who planted their crops in despair will shout hurrahs at the harvest. So those who went off with weary, with heavy hearts will come home laughing with armloads of blessing. Phyllis McGinley says, I have read that during the process of canonization, the Catholic Church demands proof of joy in the candidate. And although I have not been able to track down the chapter and verse, I like the suggestion that dourness is not a sacred attribute. In Phyllis McGinley's delightful book, Saint Watching, there is the story. Martin Luther's close friend was Philip Melanchthon, author of the Augsburg Confession. Melanchthon was a cool man, where Luther was fervid, a scholar as opposed to a doer, and he continued to live like a monk even after he had joined the German Reformation. One day, Luther lost patience with Melanchthon's virtuous reserve. For heaven's sake, he roared, why don't you go out and sin a little? God deserves to have something to forgive you for. <laughs> and I think that is really good. That is so true. And I was reading something by Charles Spurgeon, and he was saying that one thing that he will miss being in heaven is being able to just sit at the cross you know, under Jesus' feet and just be asking for forgiveness, because that's something we won't have to do anymore in heaven. But when we're at Jesus' feet, you know, confessing and asking for forgiveness that is the safest most like best place we can be so don't be afraid when you do things wrong or things go bad or you fall just get up you know go back to God ask for forgiveness and keep going that's the most important thing is just dust yourself off and keep going because the only time the devil can get you is if you quit. So just, no matter what happens, just dust yourself off and keep going. And that's the only thing, really. Anyways, let's continue. 
I love this whole chapter on joy, so I'm going to read it to you guys because pretty much nobody we see is living joy. So let's get this deep into our hearts and fully understand and try to live by it. And this chapter is just so amazing. So about joy, he says it's a consequence, not a requirement. As the psalm says, we laughed, we sang, we couldn't believe our good fortune. This is the authentic Christian note, a sign of those who are on the way of salvation. Joy is characteristic of Christian pilgrimage. It is the second in Paul's lists, list of the fruits of the Spirit, Galatians 5, 23 It is the first of Jesus' signs in the Gospel of John, turning water into wine. It was said of the Hasid Levi Yitzhak of Berndischev, his smiles were fraught with greater meaning than his sermons. The same thing can be said of much of the Bible. Its smiles carry more meaning than its sermons. This is not to say that joy is a moral requirement for the Christian living. Some of us experience events that are full of sadness and pain. Some of us descend to low points in our lives when joy seems to have permanently departed. We must not, in such circumstances or during such times, say, well, that's the final proof that I'm not a good Christian. Christians are supposed to have their mouths filled with laughter and tongues with shouts of joy, and I don't. I'm not joyful, therefore I must not be a Christian. No, joy is not a requirement of Christian discipleship. It is a consequence. It is not what we have to acquire in order to experience life in Christ. It is what comes to us when we are walking in the way of faith and obedience. We come to God and to the revelation of God's ways because none of us have it within ourselves, except momentarily to be joyous. Joy is a product of abundance. It is the overflow of virtuous living together harmoniously. It is the exuberance of God. And just as we are, none of us can manage that for a length of time. We try to get it through entertainment. We pay someone to make jokes, tell stories, perform dramatic actions, sing songs. We buy the vitality of another's imagination to divert and enliven our own poor lives. The enormous entertainment industry in America is a sign of the depletion of joy in our culture. Society is a bored, gluttonous king, employing a court jester to divert it after an overindulgent meal. But that kind of joy never penetrates our lives, never changes our basic constitution. The effects are extremely temporary, a few minutes, a few hours, a few days at most. When we run out of money, the joy trickles away. We cannot make ourselves joyful. Joy cannot be commanded, purchased, or arranged. But there is something we can do. We can decide to live in response to the abundance of God and not under the dictatorship of our own poor needs. We can decide to live in the environment of a living God and not our own dying selves. We can decide to center ourselves in the God who generously gives and not in our own egos which greedily grab. One of the certain consequences of such a life is joy, the kind expressed in Psalm 126. The center sentence in the psalm is, We are one happy people, verse 3. The words on one side of that center, verses 1 through 2, are in the past tense. The words on the other side, verse 4 through 6, in the future tense. Present gladness has past and future. It is not an inferior emotion. It is not a spurt of good feelings that comes when the weather and the stock market are both right on the same day. The background for joy is only alluded to here. But the words trigger vast memories. When God returned Israel's exiles, we laughed, we sang, we were the talk of the nations. God was wonderful to them. God was wonderful to us. We are one happy people. What happened that was so wonderful? On nearly any page of the Bible, we find the allusions and stories. There is a story of God's people in a long, apparently intermittent, interminable servitude under the shadows of the Egyptian pyramids and the lash of harsh masters. And then, suddenly and without warning, it was over. One day they were making bricks without straw, and the next they were running up the far slopes of the Red Sea, shouting the great song. I'm singing my heart out to God. What a victory! He pitched horse and rider into the sea. God is my strength. God is my song. And yes, God is my salvation. 
this is the kind of God I have. I'm telling the world, this is the God of my father. I'm raising the roof. Exodus 15, 1 through 2. We turn over a few pages and find the story of David. There were years of wilderness guerrilla warfare against the Philistines, a perilous existence with moody maniac, <laughs> maniac King Saul, and that painful groping and praying through the guilt of murder and adultery. Then in his old age he was chased from his throne by his own son and was forced to set up a government in exile. And at the end his song, it begins with gratitude. God is my bedrock under my feet, the castle in which I live, my rescuing knight. It ends in confidence. Live God, blessing from my rock. In the center there is a rocket burst of joy. I'm ablaze with your light. I vault the high fences. Second Samuel 22, verse 2, 47 and 29 through 30. We turn a few more pages and find the terrible story of the Babylonian captivity. Israel experiences the worst that can come in any of us. Rape in the streets, cannibalism in the kitchens, neighborhoods reduced to bestiality, a 600-mile force marched across the desert, the taunting mockeries of captors, and then, incredibly, joy. Beginning with low, gentle words. Comfort, O oh, comfort my people, says your God. Speak softly and tenderly to Jerusalem, but also firmly and boldly that she has served her sentence, that her sin is taken care of, forgiven, Isaiah 40, 1 through 2. And then the swelling reassurances of help. When you're in over your head, I'll be there with you. Don't be afraid, I'm with you, Isaiah 43, 2 verse, Isaiah 43, 2 through 5. The sounds combine and surge to a proclamation. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of the messengers bringing good news. Voices, listen. Your scouts are shouting, thunderclap shouts, shouting in joyful unison. 53, 52, 7 through 8. The gratitude and gladness build and soar. There is a sea change into joy. It seemed like a dream, too good to be true when God returned to Israel's exiles. Each act of God was an impossible miracle. There was no way it could have happened, and it did happen. It seemed like a dream, too good to be true. We nurture those memories of laughter, those shouts of joy. We fill our minds with the stories of God's acts. Joy has a history. Joy is the verified, repeated existence of those involved in what God is doing. It is as real as a date in history, as solid as a stratum of rock in Palestine. Joy is nurtured by living in such a history, building on such a foundation. Joyful Expectation The other side of we are one happy people, verses 4 through 6, is in the future sense. Joy is nurtured by anticipation. If the joy-producing acts of God are characteristic of our past as God's people, they will also be characteristic of our future as his people. There is no reason to suppose that God will arbitrarily change his way of working with us. What we have known of him, we will know of him. Just as joy builds on the past, it borrows from the future. It expects certain things to happen. Two images fix the hope. The first is, bring rains to our drought-stricken lives. The Negev, the south of Israel, is a vast desert. The watercourses of the Negev are a network of ditches cut into the soil by wind and rain erosion. For most of the year, they are baked dry under the sun, but a sudden rain makes the desert ablaze with blossoms. Our lives are like that, drought-stricken, and then suddenly the long years of barren waiting are interrupted by God's invasion of grace. The second image is, So those who planted their crops in despair will shout hurrahs at the harvest. So those who went off with heavy hearts will come home laughing with armloads of blessing. The hard work of sowing seed in what looks like perfectly empty earth has as every farmer knows, a time of harvest. All suffering, all pain, all emptiness, all disappointment is seed. Sow it in God, and he will finally bring a crop of joy from it. It is clear in Psalm 126 that the one who wrote it and those who sang it were no strangers to the dark side of things. They carried the painful memory of exile in their bones and the scar of oppression on their backs. They knew the deserts of the heart, and the nights of weeping. 
They knew what it meant to sow in tears. One of the most interesting and remarkable things Christians learn is that laughter does not exclude weeping. Christian joy is not an escape from sorrow. Pain and hardship will still come, but they are unable to drive out the happiness of the redeemed. A common but futile strategy for achieving joy is trying to eliminate the things that hurt. Get rid of pain by numbing the nerve ends. Get rid of insecurity by eliminating risks. Get rid of the disappointment by depersonalizing your relationships. And then try to lighten the boredom of such a life by buying joy in the form of vacations and entertainment. There isn't a hint of that in Psalm 126. Laughter is a result of living in the midst of God's great works. Like when God returned to Israel's exiles, we laughed, we sang, as the verse says. Enjoyment is not an escape from boredom, but a plunge by faith into God's work. Those who went off with heavy hearts will come home laughing with armloads of blessing. There is plenty of suffering on both sides, past and future. The joy comes because God knows how to wipe away tears, and in his resurrection work, create the smile of new life. Joy is what God gives, not what we work up. Laughter is the delight of the things working together for good to those who love God, not the giggles that, de- that betray the nervousness of a precarious defense system. The joy that develops in the Christian way of discipleship is an overflow of spirits that comes from feeling good, not about yourself, but about God. We find that His ways are dependable, His promises sure. This joy is not dependent on our good luck and escaping hardship. It is not dependent on our good health and avoidance of pain. Christian joy is actually in the midst of pain, suffering, loneliness, and misfortune. St. Paul is our most convincing witness to this. He is always, in one way or another, shouting out his joy. The shouts are tympanic, resonating through every movement of his life. We continue to shout our praise, even when we're hemmed in with troubles, because we know how troubles can develop passionate patience in us, and how that patience in turn forges the tempered steel of virtue, keeping us alert for whatever God will do next. We sing and shout our praises to God through Jesus the Messiah. Romans 5, 3 through 5 and 11. That is the fulfillment of the prayer. And now, God, do it again. Bring rains to our drought-stricken lives. And then out of his prison cell, we hear Paul trumpeting conclusion to his Philippian letter. Celebrate God all day, every day. I mean, revel in him. Make it as clear as you can to all that you meet that, that you're on their side, working with them and not against them. Help them see that the master is about to arrive. He could show up any minute. Philippians 4, 4 through 5. There is no grim Greek stoicism in that. It is a robust Welsh hymn striding from sorrow into song. It is the end result of the hope, so that those who went off with heavy hearts will come home laughing with armloads of blessing. The witness is repeated over and over again through the generations and has scattered representatives in every community of Christians. You know, I was listening to another um, pastor or preacher, and he was saying, you know, as Christians... We ought to be the happiest people in the world, you know, with not one worry, just, you know, as we go along, we're doing things and we're on our way to glory. So what is there to be worried about? And Christians ought to be the happiest people in the world. We have nothing to be scared about. We know our eternal destination. We have that joy and we must show it to others. Anyway, it was just beautiful. Chapter 9 on work. Psalm 127. If God doesn't build the house, the builders only build shacks. If God doesn't guard the city, the night watchman might as well nap. It's useless to rise early and go to bed late and work your worried fingers to the bone. Don't you know he enjoys giving rest to those he loves? Don't you see that children are God's best gift, the fruit of the womb his generous legacy? Like a warrior's fistful of arrows are the children of a vigorous youth. Oh, how blessed are you parents with your quivers full of children. Your enemies don't stand a chance against you. You'll sweep them right off your doorstep. So in talking about work, he says, Neither be anxious and overdoing or lethargic, but by joining Jesus and the psalm, we learn a way of work that does not acquire things or amass possessions, 
where responds to God and develops relationships. People are at the center of Christian work. In the way of pilgrimage, we do not drive cumbersome in the wagons loaded down with baggage over endless prairies. We travel light. The character of our work is shaped not by accomplishments or possessions, but in the birth of relationships. Children are God's best gift. We invest our energy in people. Among those around us, we develop sons and daughters, sisters and brothers, even as our Lord did with us. Oh, how blessed are you parents with your quivers full of children. For it makes very little difference how much money Christians carry in their wallets or purses. It makes little difference how our culture values and rewards our work, if God doesn't. For our work creates neither life nor righteousness. Relentless, compulsive work habits, like the psalm says, work your worried fingers to the bone, you know how it alludes to how some people do that, which our society rewards and admires, are seen by the psalmist as a sign of weak faith and assertive pride, as if God could not be trusted to accomplish his will, as if we could rearrange the universe by our own effort. What does make a difference is the personal relationships that we create and develop. We learn a name, we start a friendship, we follow up on a smile, or maybe even on a grimace. Nature, nature is prolificate with its seeds, scattering them everywhere. A few of them sprout. Out of numerous handshakes and greetings, some germinate and grow into a friendship in Christ. Christian worship gathers the energy and focuses the motivation that transforms us from consumers who use work to get things into people, who use work to get things into people who are intimate and in whom work is a way of being in creative relationship with another. Such work can be done within the structure of any job, career, or profession. As Christians do the jobs and tasks assigned to them in what the world calls work, we learn to pay attention to and practice what God is doing in love and justice, in helping and healing, in liberating and cheering. Chapter 10. Happiness Psalm 128. All you who fear God, how blessed you are! How happily you walk on his smooth, straight road! You worked hard and deserve all you've got coming. Enjoy the blessing, revel in the goodness. Your wife will bear children as a vine bears grapes, your household lush as a vineyard, the children around your table, as fresh and promising as young olive shoots. Stand in awe of God's yes. Oh, how he blesses the one who fears God! Enjoy the good life in Jerusalem every day of your life, and enjoy your grandchildren. Peace to Israel. So when he talks about fear God, reverence might be a better word, awe. The Bible isn't interested in whether we believe in God or not. It assumes that everyone more or less does. What is, what is interested in is the response we have to him. Will we let God be as he is, majestic and holy, vast and wondrous? Or will we always be trying to whittle him down to the size of our small minds, insist on confining him within the boundaries we are comfortable with, refuse to think of him other than the images that we convey? No, we must be in awe. To guard against all such blasphemous chumminess with the Almighty, the Bible talks of the fear of the Lord, not to scare us, but to bring us to awesome attention before the overwhelming grandeur of God, to shut up our whining and chattering and stop our running and fidgeting so that we can really see him as he is and listen to him as he speaks his merciful, life-changing words of forgiveness. Now the next chapter, which is on hope. He says, to be human is to be in trouble. Job's anguish is our epigraph. Like he says, man is born to trouble as the sparks fly upward. Suffering is a characteristic of the personal. Animals can be hurt, but they do not suffer. The earth can be ravaged, yet it cannot suffer. Man and woman alone in the creation suffer. For suffering is pain, plus physical or emotional pain, plus the awareness that our own worth as people is threatened, that our own value as creatures made in the dignity of God is called into question, that our own destiny as eternal souls is jeopardized. Are we finally to be? Are we to be finally nothing? Are we to be discarded? Are we to be rejects in the universe and thrown onto the garbage dump of humanity, 
because our bodies degenerate or our emotions malfunction or our minds become confused or our families find fault with us or society avoids us? Any one of those things, or, as is more likely a combination of them, can put us in the state Psalm 130 describes as, The bottom has fallen out of my life. A Christian is a person who decides to face and live through suffering. If we do not make that decision, we are endangered on every side. A man or woman of faith who fails to acknowledge and deal with suffering becomes at last either a cynic or a melancholic or a suicide. Psalm 130 grapples mightily with suffering, sings its way through it, and provides usable experience for those who are committed to traveling the way of faith to God through Jesus Christ. Hoping does not mean doing nothing. It is not fatalistic resignation. It means going about our assigned tasks, confident that God will provide the meaning and the conclusions. It is not compelled to work away at keeping up appearances with a bogus spirituality. It is the opposite of desperate and panicky manipulations, of scurrying and worrying. And hoping is not dreaming. It is not spinning an illusion or fantasy to protect us from our boredom or our pain. It means a confident, alert expectation that God will do what he said he will do. It is imagination put in the harness of faith. It is willingness to let God do it his way and in his time. It is the opposite of making plans that we demand that God put into effect, telling him both how and when to do it. That is not hoping in God, but bullying God. I pray to God my life a prayer and wait for what he'll say and do. My life's on the line before God, my Lord, waiting and watching till morning, waiting and watching till morning, as the psalm says. Now we are persuaded that God's way with us is redemption, and that the redemption, not the suffering, is ultimate. The bottom has a bottom, the heights are boundless. Knowing that, we are helped to go ahead and learn the skills of waiting and watching, hoping, by which God is given room to work out our salvation, and develop our faith while we fix our attention on his ways of grace and resurrection. Chapter 13 on Humility Psalm 131 God, I'm not trying to rule the roost. I don't want to be king of the mountain. I haven't meddled where I have no business or fantasized grandiose plans. I've kept my feet on the ground. I've cultivated a quiet heart. Like a baby content in its mother's arms, my soul is a baby content. Wait, Israel, for God. Wait with hope. Hope now, hope always. John Bailey says, Humility is the obverse side of confidence in God, whereas pride is the obverse side of confidence in self. Humility is, I will not try to run my own life or the lives of others. That is God's business. I will not pretend to invent the meaning of the universe. I will accept what God has shown its meaning to be. I will not strut about demanding that I be treated as the center of my family or my neighborhood or my work, but seek to discover where I fit and do what I am good at. The soul, clamoring for attention and arrogantly parading its importance, is calmed and quieted so that it can be itself, truly, as content as a child. But what if we are not to be proud, clamorous, arrogant persons? But if we are not to be proud, clamorous, arrogant persons, what are we to be? Mousy, cringing, insecure ones? Well, not quite. Having realized the dangers of pride, the sin of thinking too much of ourselves, we are suddenly in danger of another mistake, thinking too little of ourselves. There are some who conclude that since the great Christian temptation is to try to be everything, the perfect Christian solution is to be nothing. And so we have the problem of the doormat Christian and the dishrag saint, the person upon whom everyone walks and wipes their feet, the person who is used by others to clean up the mess of everyday living and then is discarded. These people then compensate for their poor lives by weepily clinging to God, hoping to make up for the miseries of everyday life by dreaming of luxuries in heaven. Christian faith is not neurotic dependency, but childlike trust. We do not have a God who forever indulges our whims, but a God whom we trust with our destinies. 
Now many who have traveled this way of faith have described the transition from an infantile faith that grabs at God out of desperation to a mature faith that responds to God out of love, like a baby content in its mother's arms. Often our conscious Christian lives do begin at points of desperation, and God, of course, does not refuse to meet our needs. Heavenly comforts break through our despair and persuade us that all will be well, and all manner of things will be well. The early stages of Christian belief are not infrequently marked with the miraculous signs and exhilarations of spirit. But as discipleship continues, the sensible comforts gradually disappear. For God does not want us to neurotically depend dependent on Him, but willingly trustful in Him. And so He weans us. The period of infancy will not be sentimentally extended beyond what is necessary. The time of weaning is very often noisy and marked by misunderstandings. I no longer feel like I did when I first was a Christian. Does that mean I am no longer a Christian? Has God abandoned me? Have I done something terribly wrong? The answer is neither. God hasn't abandoned you and you haven't done anything wrong. You are being weaned. The apron strings have been cut. You are free to come to God or not come to Him. You are, in a sense, on your own, with an open invitation to listen and receive and enjoy our Lord. The last line of the psalm addresses this quality of newly acquired freedom. Wait, Israel, for God. Wait with hope. Hope now. Hope always. Choose to be with Him. Elect His presence. Aspire to His ways. Respond to His love. The Plain Way When Charles Spurgeon preached this psalm, he said, it is one of the shortest psalms to read, but one of the longest to learn. You know, Psalms 131. Because we are always, it seems, reeling from one side of the road to the other as we travel in the way of faith. At one turning of the road, we are presented with awesome problems and terrifying emergencies. We rise to the challenge, take things into our own hands to become master of the situation, telling God, thank you, but get lost. We'll take care of this one ourselves. And at the next turning, we are overwhelmed and run in a panic to some kind of infantile religion that will solve all our problems for us, freeing us of the burden of thinking and the difficulty of choosing. We are, alternately, rebellious runaways and whining babies. Worse, we have a numerous expert so-called encouraging us to pursue one or the other of these ways, you know, that offer us a myriad of solutions and ways of paying them money to do so. But that is not what we need. And that is what Psalms 131 nurtures. A quality of calm confidence and quiet strength that knows the difference between unruly arrogance and faithful aspiration. Knows how to discriminate between infantile dependency and childlike trust. And chooses to aspire and to trust and to sing. I've kept my feet on the ground. I've cultivated a quiet heart. Like a baby content in its mother's arms. My soul is a baby content. Chapter 14 on Obedience Psalm 132 The parabolic force of the instant, which he tells a story of being in the hospital, is this. When the man was scared, he wanted me to pray for him. And when the man was crazy, he wanted me to pray for him. But in between, during the hours of so-called normalcy, he didn't want anything to do with the pastor. What Kelly betrayed in Extremis is all many people know religion, a religion to help them with their fears, but that is forgotten when the fears are taken care of, a religion made of moments of craziness, but that is remote and shadowy in the clear light of the sun and the routines of every day. The most religious places in the world, as a matter of fact, are not churches, but battlefields and mental hospitals. You are much more likely to find a passionate prayer in a foxhole than in a church pew, and you will certainly find more otherworldly visions and supernatural voices in a mental hospital than you will in a church. And I must say, this is so true. So be stable, not petrified. Nevertheless, we Christians don't go to either place to nurture our faith. We are stable, not petrified. You know, what would we think of a pollster who issued a definitive report on how the American people felt about a new television special if we discovered later that he had interviewed only one person who had seen only 10 minutes of the program? We would dismiss the conclusions as frivolous. 
Yet that is exactly the kind of evidence that too many Christians accept as the final truth about many much more important matters. Matters such as answered prayer, God's judgment, Christ's forgiveness, eternal salvation. The only person they consult is themselves, and the only experience they evaluate is the most recent ten minutes. But we need other experiences, the community of experience of brothers and sisters in the church, the centuries of experience provided by our biblical ancestors. A Christian who has David in his bones, Jeremiah in his bloodstream, Paul in his fingertips, and Christ in his heart, will know how much and how little value to put on his own momentary feelings and the experience of the past week. Chapter 15 on Community, Psalm 133. How wonderful, how beautiful, when brothers and sisters get along. It is like costly anointing oil flowing down head and beard, flowing down Aaron's beard, flowing down the collar of his priestly robes. It is like the dew on Mount Hermon, flowing down the slopes of Zion. Yes, that is where God commands the blessing, ordains eternal life. And actually, when I was reading this psalm, it reminded me of the TV um, series called The Chosen, which is about the life of Christ. It is so good. You guys have to watch it. But it reminds me in one of the first or second seasons um, of Jesus being with the little children, that episode. And they sing this song. I think um, the Jews, they have, they actually sing this song and it is so beautiful. You have to listen to it. Anyway, so we're talking about community. And this really stood out to me. I was like, wow. You know, brothers and sisters in faith are not always nice people. They do not stop being sinners the moment they begin believing in Christ. They don't suddenly metamorphose into brilliant conversationalists, exciting companions and glowing inspirations. Some of them are cranky, some of them are dull, and others, if the truth must be spoken, a drag. But at the same time, our Lord tells us that they are brothers and sisters in faith. If God is my father, then this is my family. So the question is not, am I going to be a part of this a community of faith? But how am I going to live in this community of faith? God's children do different things. Some run away from it and pretend that the family doesn't exist. Some move out and get an apartment on their own from which they return to make occasional visits, nearly always showing up for the parties and bringing a gift to show that they really do hold the others in fond regard. And some would never dream of leaving, but cause others to dream it for them. For they are always criticizing what is served at the meals, quarreling with the way the housekeeping is done, and complaining that the others in the family are either ignoring or taking advantage of them. And yet some determine to find out what God has in mind by placing them in the community called a church, learn how to function in it harmoniously and joyously, and develop the maturity that is able to share and exchange God's grace with those who might otherwise be viewed as nuisances. You know, Psalms 133 presents what we are after. How wonderful, how beautiful when brothers and sisters get along. The psalm puts into song what is said and demonstrated throughout Scripture and church. That community is essential. Scripture knows nothing of the solitary Christian. People of faith are always members of a community. Creation itself was not complete until there was a community. Adam needing Eve before humanity was whole. God never works with individuals in isolation, but always with people in community. This is the biblical datum, and that with which we must begin. Jesus worked with twelve disciples and lived with them in community. The church was formed when 120 people were all together in one place, Acts 2 verse 1 and again 5 verse 12. When some early Christians were dropping out of community and pursuing private interests, a pastor wrote to them, urging them to nurture their precious gift of community, not avoiding worshiping together as some do, but spurring each other on, especially as we see the big day approaching. Hebrews 10 verse 25. The Bible knows nothing of a religion defined by what person does inwardly in the privacy of the thought or feeling or apart from others on a lonely retreat. When Jesus was asked what the great commandment was, he said, Love the Lord your God with all your passion and prayer and intelligence. You know, all your mind, all your heart, all your strength. 
and that immediately before anyone could go off and make a private religion of it. You know, that I come to the garden alone or something. He riveted it with to another. There is a second to set alongside it. Love others as well as you love yourself. Matthew twenty two thirty three through 40. You know, Christians make this explicit in their act of worship each week by gathering as a community. Other people are unavoidably present. As we come to declare our love for God, we must face the unlovely and lovely fellow sinners whom God loves and commands us to love. This must not be treated as something to put up with. One of the inconvenient necessities of faith in the way of that paying taxes is an inconvenient consequence of living in a secure and free nation. It is not only necessary, it is desirable that our faith have a social dimension, a human relationship. How wonderful, how beautiful when brothers and sisters get along. For centuries, the psalm was sung on the road as throngs of people made this end to Jerusalem for festival worship. Our imaginations readily reconstruct those scenes. How great to have everyone sharing a common purpose, traveling a common path, striving towards a common goal, that path and purpose and goal being God. How much better than making the long trip alone? You know, how good, how delightful it is for all to live together like brothers. But if living in community is necessary and desirable, it is also enormously difficult. There is a clue to the nature of difficulty in the phrase, when brothers and sisters get along. Because most Christians have some first-hand experience of what it means to live with brothers and sisters. Brothers fight, and sisters fight. The first story in the Bible about brothers living together is the story of Cain and Abel, and it is a murder story. Significantly, their fight was a religious fight, a quarrel over which of them God loved best. The story of Joseph and his brothers follows a few pages later, in which Joseph, envied by the rest, is sold into Egypt as a slave. Miriam and Aaron quarreled with their brother Moses. David and his brothers fare no better and add to the evidence of discord. Even Jesus and his brothers are evidence of disharmony rather than peace. The one picture we have of them shows the brothers misunderstanding Jesus and trying to drag him away from his messianic work because they are convinced that he is crazy. Those who have acquired their knowledge of human relationships by reading psychology books instead of the Bible find the case histories on this subject under the chapter entitled Sibling Rivalry. But most of what is there is only a footnote to what scripture says. Children fight a lot. Each brother is quick to take offense if he doesn't get his own way. And each sister wants a major share of the parent's attention. Children are ordinarily so full of their own needs and wants that they look at a brother or sister not as an ally, but as a competitor. If there is only one pork chop on the plate and three of us who want it, I will look at my brother and sister not as delightful dinner companions, but as difficult rivals. Much of the literature of the world, you know, novels, plays, and poetry, documents this. Living together like brothers and sisters means an actual practice, endless squabbles, murderous quarrels, and angry arguments. And so if we are going to sing, how wonderful, how beautiful when brothers and sisters get along, we will not do it by being left to ourselves following our natural bent. If we do, we will only get into a big fight, and the only wonderful thing about it will be the pleasure the spectators get in watching us bloody each other's noses. Living together in a way that evokes the glad song of Psalms 133 is one of the great and arduous tasks before Christ's people. Nothing requires more attention and energy. It is easier to do almost anything else. It is far easier to deal with people as problems to be solved than to have anything to do with them in community. If a person can be isolated from the family, from husband, from wife, from parents, from children, from neighbors, and then be professionally counseled, advised, and guided without the complications of all those relationships, things are very much simpler. But if such practices are engaged in systematically, they become an avoidance of community. Christians are a community of people who are visibly together at worship, but who remain in relation throughout the week in witness and service, because in the beginning is the relation. 
Another common way to avoid community is to turn to church into an institution. In this way, people are treated not on the basis of personal relationships, but in terms of impersonal functions. Goals are set that will catch the imagination of the largest numbers of people. Structures are developed that will accomplish the goal of through planning and organization. Organizational planning and institutional goals become the criteria by which the community is defined and evaluated. In the process, the church becomes less and less a community. That is, people who pay attention to each other, brothers and sisters, and more and more a collectivism of contributing units. Now, every community of Christians is imperiled when either of those routes are pursued. The route of defining others as problems to be solved, the way one might repair an automobile, the route of lumping persons together in terms of economic ability or institutional effectiveness, the way one might run a bank. But somewhere in between there is community, a place where each person is taken seriously, learns to trust others, depend on others, be compassionate with others, rejoice with others. How wonderful, how beautiful when brothers and sisters get along. To finish up on community, he says it's important in any community of faith is an ever-renewed expectation in what God is doing with our brothers and sisters in the faith. We refuse to label the others as one thing or another. We refuse to protect our brother's behavior, our sister's growth. Each person in the community is unique. Each is specially loved and particularly led by the Spirit of God. How can I presume to make conclusions about anyone? How can I pretend to know your worth or your place? Margaret Mead, who made learned and passionate protests against the ways modern culture flattens out and demoralizes people, wrote, No recorded cultural system has ever had enough different expectations to match all the children who were ever born within it. A community of faith flourishes when we view each other with the expectancy, wondering what God will do today in this one and that one. When we are in a community with those Christ loves and redeems, we are constantly finding out new things about them, they are new persons each morning, endless in their possibilities. We explore the fascinating depths of their friendship, share the secrets of their quest. It is impossible to be bored in such a community, impossible to feel alienated among such people. The oil flowing down Aaron's beard communicates warm, priestly relationship. The dew descending down Hermon's slopes communicates fresh and expectant newness. Oil and dew, the two things that make life together delightful. Browsing Good Fellowship. The last line of the psalm concludes that the good and delightful life together is where God commands the blessing, ordains eternal life. Christians are always attempting and never quite succeed at getting a picture of the life everlasting. When we try to imagine it, we only banalize it. And then, having scrawled an uninteresting and amateur sketch using the paint pots of an impoverished faith, we announce that we are not so sure we want to spend eternity in a place like that. Maybe we would prefer the rousing good fellowship of hell. Psalm 133 throws out just a hint of heaven, a hint that is expanded into a grand vision in Revelations 4 through 5, turning that on its head. The rousing good fellowship is in heaven, where relationships are warm and expectancies fresh. We are already beginning to enjoy the life together that will be completed in our life everlasting, which means that heaven is like nothing quite so much as a good party. Assemble in your imagination all the friends you enjoy being with most, the companions who evoke the deepest joy, your most stimulating relationships, the most delightful of shared experiences, the people with whom you feel completely alive. That is a hint at heaven, for there God commands the blessing, ordains eternal life. In talking about blessing, he says, God gets down on his knees among us gets on our level and shares himself with us. He does not reside afar off and send us diplomatic messages. He kneels among us. That posture is characteristic of God. The discovery and realization of this is what defines what we know of God as good news. God shares himself generously and graciously. Whichever form the blessing takes, it implies an exchange of the contents of the soul. God enters into our need. He anticipates our goals. He gets into our skin and understands us better than we do ourselves. This is just so beautiful. And when a man is full of God, you will see that also in that man. 
and I have seen that and that gentleness, that pureness, that love, it's unexplainable. It just, it makes you believe that God is real. So we'll end this off with the chapter on blessing. It's an invitation and a command. There's no better summarizing and concluding word in all scripture than blessing. It describes what we most prize in God's dealing with us and what is most attractive when we evaluate our way of living. Every act of worship concludes with a benediction. Psalm 134 features the word in a form that might be called an invitational command. Come, bless God, lift your praising hands, and bless God. The persons who first sang this song had been traveling, literally, the roads that led to Jerusalem. Now they had arrived and were at the temple to worship God in festival celebration. Some would have been on the road for days, some for weeks, in some instances perhaps for months. Now that they were at the end of the road, what would happen? What would they feel inside? What would they do? Would there be the deadness inside? Read one way, the sentence is an invitation. Come, bless God. The great promise of being in Jerusalem is that all may join in the rich temple worship. You are welcome now to do it. Come and join in. Don't be shy. Don't hold back. Did you have a fight with your spouse on the way? That's all right. You are here now. Bless God. Did you quarrel with your neighbor while making the trip? Forget it. You are here now. Bless God. Did you lose touch with your children while coming and aren't sure just where they are now? Put that aside for the moment. They have their own pilgrimage to make. You are here. Bless God. Are you ashamed of the feelings that you had while traveling? The grumbling you indulged in? The resentment you harbored? Well, it wasn't bad enough to keep you from arriving. And now that you are here bless God. Are you embarrassed at the number of times you quit and had to have someone pick you up and carry you along? No matter, you are here. Bless God. The sentence is an invitation. It is also a command. Having arrived at the place of worship, will we now sit around and tell stories about the trip? Having gotten to the big city, will we spend our time here as tourists, visiting the bazaars, window shopping and trading? Having gotten Jerusalem checked off our list of things to do, will we immediately begin looking for another challenge, another holy place to visit? Will the temple be a place to socialize, receive congratulations from others in our achievement, a place to share gossip and trade stories, a place to make business contracts that will improve our prospects back home? But that is not why you made the trip. Bless God. You are here because God blessed you. Now you bless God. Our stories may be interesting, but they are not the point. Our achievements may be marvelous, but they are not germane. Our curiosity may be understandable, but it is not relevant. Bless the Lord. Like the verse says, when the complete arrives, our incompletes will be canceled. 1 Corinthians 13 verse 10. Bless God. Do that for which you were created and redeemed. Lift your voices in gratitude. Enter into the community of praise and prayer that into anticipates the final consummation of faith in heaven. Bless God. Feelings don't run the show. We are invited to bless the Lord. We are commanded to bless the Lord. And then someone says, but I don't feel like it. And I won't be a hypocrite. I can't bless God if I don't feel like blessing God. I wouldn't be honest. The biblical response to that is, lift up your praising hands to the holy place and bless God. You can lift up your hands regardless of how you feel. It's a simple motor movement. You may not be able to command your heart, but you can command your arms. Lift your arms in blessing. Just maybe your heart will get the message and be lifted up also in praise. We are psychosomatic beings. Body and spirit are intricately interrelated. Go through the motions of blessing God and your spirit will pick up the cue and follow along. For why do men lift their hands when they pray? Is it not that their hearts may be raised at the same time to God? It isn't quite the same thing, and there are many differences in detail. But there is a broad similarity between the directions in the psalm and the contemporary movement known as behavior modification, which in a rough and ready way means that you can act yourself into a new way of being. Find, and follow, find the right things to do, practice the right actions, and other things will follow. Lift up your praising hands to the holy place and bless God. Act your gratitude. Pantomime your thanks. You will become that which you do. Many think that the only way to change your behavior is to first change your feelings. 
We take a pill to alter our mood so that we won't kick the dog. We turn on music to soothe our emotions so that our conversation will be less abrasive. But there is an older wisdom that puts it differently. By changing our behavior, we can change our feelings. One person says, I don't like that man, therefore I will not speak to him. When and if my feelings change, I will speak. Another says, I don't like that person, therefore I am going to speak to him. The person, surprised at the friendliness, cheerfully responds and suddenly friendliness is shared. One person says, I don't feel like worshipping, therefore... One person says, I don't feel like worshipping, therefore I am not going to church. I will wait till I feel like it, and then I will go. Another says, I don't feel like worshipping, therefore I will go to church and put myself in the way of worship. In the process, she finds herself blessed and, be and in turn begins to bless others. Most probably the people who were first addressed by this command were the professional leaders of worship in the Jerusalem temple, the Levites, you priests of God posted to the night watch in God's shrine. They worked in shifts around the clock during festival time, and through the night some of them were always on duty. The great danger in those hours was that the worship might be listless and slovenly. What can you expect at three o'clock in the morning? No excuses, says the psalm singer. Your feelings might be flat, but you can control your muscles. Lift up your hands. Humphrey Bogart once defined a professional as a person who did a better job when he didn't feel like it. That goes for a Christian, too. Feelings don't run the show. There is a reality deeper than our feelings. Live by that. Eric Rutley thinks that colloquially, to bless means to speak well of. The Lord has spoken well of you. Now you speak well of him. Taking God seriously, but not ourselves. It is as easy to find instances of people who bless in Christian ranks as it is to find examples of people who curse in the worlds. Karl Barth, he says, is one of my favorites. He is one of the great theologians of all time, but the really attractive thing about him is that he was a man who blessed God. His mind was massive, his learning immense, his theological industry simply staggering. He wrote a six million word, 7,000 page, 12 volume dogmatics, plus 40 or 50 other books and several hundred learned articles. Impressive as that is, what is far more impressive, to me at least, is what he called Dankbarkeit, gratitude. Always and everywhere we are aware that Barth was responding to God's grace. There is a chuckle under, rumbling underneath his most serious prose. There is a twinkle on the edges of his eyes always. He never took himself seriously, and always took God seriously, and therefore he was full of cheerfulness, exuberant with blessing. I think this is so powerful. I mark this as something that says, I need to be like this. He never took himself seriously and always took God seriously. And therefore he was full of cheerfulness, exuberant with blessing. Speaking of his own work as a theologian, he said, the theologian who has no joy in his work is not a theologian at all. Sulky faces, morose thoughts, and boring ways of speaking are intolerable in this science. Once, Barth was on a bus in Basel, the Swiss city in which he lived and taught for many years. A man came up and sat beside him, a tourist. Barth struck up a conversation. You are a visitor, yes? And what do you want to see in our city? The man said, I would like to see the great theologian Karl Barth. Do you know him? Oh, yes, said Barth. I shave him every morning. The man went away satisfied, telling his friends that he had met Barth's barber. Because he refused to take himself seriously and decided to take God seriously, Barth burdened neither himself nor those around him with the gloomy, heavy seriousness of ambition, or pride, or sin, or self-righteousness. Instead, the lifting up of hands, the brightness of blessing. Now, to finish this up, we'll just read one last thing. It says, there is a virtual unanimity unanimity among our Christian ancestors, that the means consist precisely in this fusion of scripture and prayer. It is not a terribly difficult way of reading and writing, but it does require diligent attentiveness. The fusion is accomplished by reading these scriptures slowly, imaginatively, prayerfully, and obediently. I'll say that again. The fusion is accomplished by reading these scriptures slowly, imaginatively, prayerfully, 
and obediently. This is the way the Bible has been read by most Christians for most of the Christian centuries, but it is not commonly read that way today. The reading style employed more often than not by contemporary Christians is fast, reductive, information gathering, and above all, practical. We read for what we can get out of it, what we can put to use, what we can think we can use, and right now, we, 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 all the way home. If we are serious about following Jesus and living out the gift of his life in detail in our bodies and circumstances, we must swim against this white water river, we, and familiarize and familiarize ourselves with the world in which Jesus and his gift of life are revealed to us. We do it by reading our scriptures slowly, imaginatively, prayerfully, and obediently. Each adverb is important. Slowly. The Bible provides the revelation of a world that has primarily to do with God. It is a huge world, far larger than what we inhabit on our own. We live in sin-cramped conditions, mostly conscious of ourselves, our feelings and frustrations, our desires and ideas, our achievements and discoveries, our failures and hurts. The Bible is deep and wide with God's love and grace, brimming over with surprises of mercy and mystery, peppered with alarming exposes of sin and bulletins of judgments. This is an immense world, and it takes time to adjust to the majesty. We're not used to anything on this scale. We've grown up on the back streets and back alleys of Lilliput. It takes a while for our eyes to adjust. If we move into the scriptures too fast or move through them too fast, we'll miss most of what is there. Imaginatively, the Bible includes us, always. Our lives are implicitly involved in everything said and done in this book. In order to realize this, we must enter the story imaginatively. We must let our conversations and experiences and thoughts be brought into the story so that we can observe what happens to us in this new context, through this storyline, rubbing shoulders with these characters. We have picked up the bad habit of reducing what we find in the Bible to ideas or slogans or principles or out-of-context verses. Forget the details, skip the mystery. We want a definition we can grasp and be comfortable with. We depersonalize the Bible into abstractions or truths that we can reconfigure and then fit into the plots that we make up for our lives. But the Bible shows us God present and active in and among living, breathing human beings, the same kind and sort of men and women that we are. Imagination is the capacity we have of crossing boundaries of space and time, with all our senses intact, and entering into other God-revealed conversations and actions, finding ourselves at home in Bible country. Prayerfully, we are taught to read in order to gather information. Our schools train us to read books so that we can pass examinations. We're good at looking for facts. Knowledge is power, they tell us. Books contain stuff that we can use to get a degree, fix an engine, hold down a job, solve a mystery. But the Bible is not primarily a source of information. It is one of the primary ways that God uses to speak to us. God's word, we call it, which is to say God's voice. God speaking to us, inviting, promising, blessing, confronting, commanding, healing. The Bible is not so much God telling us some thing, some idea, some fact, some rule, as God speaking life into us. Are we listening? Are we answering? Bible reading is prayed reading. Obediently. Obediently? We aren't used to this. We have grown up in a culture that urges us to take charge of our own lives. We are introduced to thousands of books which we are trained to use, look up information, acquire skills, master knowledge, divert ourselves, whatever. But use? Well-meaning people have told us the Bible is useful, so we pick it up, we adapt, edit, sift, summarize. We then use whatever seems useful and apply it to our circumstances, however we see fit. We take charge of the Bible, using it as a toolbox to repair our lives or as a guidebook for getting what we want, or as an inspirational track to enliven a dull day. But we aren't smart enough to do that, nor can we be trusted to do that. The author of the book is writing us into his book, we aren't writing him into ours. We find ourselves in the book as followers of Jesus. Jesus calls us to follow him and we obey, or we do not. This is an immense world of God's salvation that we are entering. We don't know enough to apply anything. Our task is to obey, believingly, trustingly obey, simply obey. 
like the title says, a long obedience in the same direction. All right, so that is the end of it. I hope you guys enjoyed it and got a lot out of it. I made this mainly for myself so I can go back and listen to it. And yeah, definitely like and subscribe if you'd like more.